Okay, I think we can we can get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us. And apologies for the delays. We were uh, just troubleshooting some some technical glitches, but uh, we're really excited to be here with you now. Uh, my name is Madeline Whittle. I'm a member of the programming team here at Film at Lincoln Center and the 58th New York Film Festival. And uh, it's really exciting to welcome you all to today's edition of the New York Film Festival Talks program. Um, we have been hosting these long, in-depth talks with filmmakers uh, uh, and other panelists over the last week and change now, and uh, we're still going strong, and we're extremely happy for today's installment of our Crosscuts talk section, uh, which is a, a category of talks that puts filmmakers from two different films into conversation with one another. Um, and we're really excited today and honored to have with us the filmmaking teams from Hopper Wells, which is screening in our spotlight section of the festival, and uh, the Tango of the Widower and its Distorting Mirror, which just wrapped up its virtual screenings as part of the current section of the festival. Uh, so I'll get into that in a bit. But first, uh, if you are watching as an attendee, please do make sure that you are set to the uh, preferred language channel. We have an interpreter who will be helping us out today, uh, interpreting for the team from Tango the Widower. And uh, so just make sure that you're either listening to the English channel or the Spanish channel, depending on your preference. Um, and so let me dive in with some thanks, first of all. Uh, the New York Film Festival has always been about bringing the community together to celebrate cinema. And whether you're joining us in our virtual cinema during this uh, installment of the New York Film Festival or at one of our drive-in venues for the screenings that we uh, have been holding uh, throughout, on behalf of everyone at Film at Lincoln Center, I wanna thank you for being part of this truly historic edition of the festival. Uh, thank you to the Lincoln Center, Phil at Lincoln Center board, patrons, members, and dedicated moviegoers uh, who make our work possible throughout the year, most especially uh, during this exciting festival season. And as a nonprofit, we rely on your support, and becoming a member is a great way to join our community of film lovers. You can take advantage of discounts and special offers while helping us to continue sharing the best in cinema with New Yorkers and in this virtual cinema context, uh, cinema lovers around the world and the country. If you're not a member, uh, you can find out how to become one today on our website, www.filmlink.org. I also want to recognize the tireless efforts of all of the staff and volunteers who've been working behind the scenes for months to uh, make this festival a reality. Uh, and you can continue to access the festival from anywhere with this free talk series. Uh, it's our most broadly accessible part of the festival because it's uh, free and online and available around the world. Uh, and you can also subscribe to the Film at Lincoln Center podcast where you'll hear, be able to hear audio of dozens of Q&As and discussions. Uh, and be sure to subscribe to our newsletter to make sure you don't miss any exciting updates or festival announcements uh, that will continue throughout the next couple of weeks. And uh, be sure to join the conversation by following along on social media, Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And you can share your festival experience with the hashtag NYFF. Last but not least, a special thank you to our many festival partners, most especially in this case, HBO, who is the presenting partner of Film at Lincoln Center Talks year round and specifically New York Film Festival Talks at this time of year. Uh, so again, thank you all for joining us. I'll just say a few more words uh, and then I'll let the conversation kick off. Um, the moderator for today's conversation is my colleague, Dan Sullivan who is the assistant programmer at Film at Lincoln Center year round and a member of the Revival's programming team uh, for this edition of New York Film Festival. Uh, and he will say a bit more about uh, who we're joined by and the films that they are representing. Um, but uh, finally, just want to say a thank you to our interpreter, Cordelia Montez, who's uh, going to help facilitate this conversation. So without any further ado, I will hand it over to Dan uh, and thank you all again. Sure, thanks Maddie. Um, yeah, great to be here with you all today. Um, as, the, as, the, as one of the programmers of the uh, sort of repertory uh, uh, section of the festival, uh, these two films are the, the two films in other sections that I'm probably the most jealous that they're not my own. Uh, um, they 
these are undeniably like um, new films, um, and and yet they're not. And I think we're gonna we're gonna get into all that, and um, hopefully it'll be a uh, productive and interesting conversation. But I want to uh, first introduce everyone. So um, here on behalf of the the Tango of the Widower and its distorting mirror, we have uh, the great filmmaker Valerius Armiento, uh, films editor Galu Alarcon. And uh, we're also joined by producer uh, Shamila Rodriguez. Um, uh, a pleasant surprise, as always. Um, and then, um, and then from Hopper Wells, we're joined by uh, the filmmaker Philip Philip Jan Rimja and uh, the editor Bob Morosky. And um, first of all, thank you all for uh, for joining us in these under these uh, deeply you know weird global circumstances. But here we are. Um, I wanted to, I guess, begin with um, with uh, the tango of the of the widower and its distorting mirror. Um, uh, in part, because I think like this is the uh, of these two films this is the one that I've known was in the works for the longest. Um, uh, Valeria, uh, you and Shamila have have joined us uh, in the past as we've been presenting um, uh, an ongoing Raul Ruiz retrospective, and we've used some of the. Um, Films that were completed after after he after he passed, um, uh, just sort of structure the series. And um, I just want to begin by just asking about um, sort of the origins of the film, the circumstances that led you all to discover um, that material on this film uh, even survived uh, today. And um, could you? Just, I, I want to get into the reconstruction later, but maybe we can just talk about the initial recovery of the film. Es una pregunta que me hacen a mí. Oh, well, well, for everyone, but uh, for you, because you were all involved to some degree, but Valeria, perhaps you should begin because uh, you're you. Bueno, el, el film de Raúl Ruiz eran solamente seis bobinas que encontramos en la bodega de un cine, el cine Normandí, que yo sabía que existían, pero nunca había las había visto ni, ni no, no conocí ese material y fue después de la muerte de Raúl pasaron años, unos, unos años en que con Shamila y Galut decidimos retomar ese material y buscar una forma de terminarlo era muy poco material era a diferencia de la obra de, de Wells era realmente había que hacerlo con muy, 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 muy poco material. Ahora lo que yo sé y entiendo es que tanto Wells como Raúl eran personas que lo que más les gustaba era filmar. Y Raúl, si no podía terminar una película, pasaba a otra, a otra, a otra. Y llegó a hacer 120 películas y, y su obsesión era filmar. Lograba terminar las películas gracias a los equipos europeos que se preocupaban de, de empujarlo a terminar las películas. Pues por eso que las películas, que casi todas las que están sin terminar, están en, son películas chilenas, y donde era mucho más difícil conseguir equipos que los ayudaran, que ayud ayudaran a Raúl a terminar la película, y además por el problema de financiamiento. Eso. Eh, también, eh, cuando estábamos haciendo la película anterior, la telenovela Errante, había algunos materiales que queríamos encontrar y había una investigación que estábamos desarrollando y a través de gente que, que preguntábamos a personas de dónde podían estar estos, estos materiales, nos indicaron que podía ser en las bodegas de un cine antiguo del casco, del casco del centro de Santiago y, y ahí fuimos y nos dimos cuenta que nosotros estábamos buscando en ese momento la telenovela errante que era en color y esta referencia que nos habían dado respecto a este cine, el material que estaba ahí era en blanco y negro. Entonces ahí yo comentamos con, con Chamila, que estaba ese material, que qué película será esa, y ahí apareció eh, Valeria, de, dijo, indicó eso, ese es el tango del viudo, y lo dejamos como esperando ahí. Luego, cuando terminamos la telenovela errante, eh, sucedió que nos gustó tanto trabajar juntos, 
<ríe> que quisimos seguir eh, trabajando en otra cosa y Valeria nos dio como una especie como de autoridad de, de buscar en eso de material en blanco y negro que estaba en ese cine y efectivamente era el tango del viudo, de lo cual eh, eh, empezamos a escarbar en, como en uh, registros que pudiesen haber existido. La película estaba completamente muda, no tenía ningún sonido, no había ninguna, ninguna pista que se pudiera rescatar. Tampoco había guión, porque Raúl en ese momento, y quizás para después también trabajaba sin guión, eh, y, era, y, y tampoco nadie se acordaba mucho de, de, de lo que había sucedido en el rodaje. Había, hay algunos actores vivos eh, y productores, personas que de alguna manera estuvieron muy curadas, pero nadie se acordaba de, de, de nada respecto a la película. La única pista que teníamos la había dejado el mismo Raúl, en algún comentario, también con conversaciones con, con Valeria, esa película había que consultarla con gente sorda eh, que manejara el lenguaje de señas como para poder leer eh, lo que, las palabras que pudieran salir de las bocas, ¿no? desde el silencio, y a través de esa lectura de las bocas y de los gestos y de la posición física, ir, empezar a interpretar textos que nos pudieran dar luz respecto a la ficción, porque este material estaba desmembrado, estaba, estaba desordenado, ¿no? estaba completamente caótico, el, lo que encontramos originalmente estaba bien clasificado, pero el interior estaba, era difícil encontrar una, una narrativa o algo que nos, era como enfrentarse al vacío. Y de alguna manera esa luz que nos dio Raúl en ese momento fue consultarlo con sordos, o sea, personas sordas, que manejaran la lectura labiofacial. Sí. Hola. Aquí desde Chile, contenta de saludarlos a todos, la audiencia online, ya eh, sería bonito estar presencialmente, pero también es interesante esta nueva manera de conectar eh, creatividad, interés en cine. Eh, para para um, acompañar lo que dice Valeria y, Ra y, y Galut, Sí, a veces me pasa que confundo la palabra Raúl con Galut, no sé por qué. No, no <ríe> la U. Sí. Eh, es, es bien interesante lo que dicen porque se encontró un material, eh, bobinas de cine, eh, desordenadas, caóticas, mudas, en silencio. Entonces hubo que construir completamente eh, todo el sonido de la película. Y para eso eh, invitamos a tres mujeres... Eh, un equipo de sordas de nacimiento profundo que pudieron eh, leer la, los labios y la expresión corporal y de ahí apareció un texto una, abstracto, bastante abstracto. Y Valeria, después de que aparece ese, ese trabajo con las sordas, invita a Omar Saavedra Santi, guionista chileno que le ha acompañado a ella en otros vuelos artísticos, a construir por primera vez un guión eh, esta película se filmó en 1967, hace más de 50 años, eh, material que estuvo guardado más de medio siglo, eh, bastante dañado en la imagen. Entonces ese también fue otro proceso muy importante que fue cómo restaurar toda la imagen y reconstruir por primera vez el sonido. Eh, eso, puedo como construir, construir, construir el sonido el y reconstruir el montaje, eh, que es el tango del viudo de Ruiz, pero de Ruiz Sarmiento es el tango del viudo y su espejo deformante, porque eh, está muy bien eh, articulada la película con dos directores, eh, Ruiz Sarmiento, eso es lo que a mí me, me gusta mucho. Que está eh, en esta película, no sé si más que en la telenovela Errante, que fue una película que, con dos directores, con dos visiones, eh, Ruiz Sarmiento, la telenovela Errante, el tango del viudo y su espejo deformante, el tango del viudo que, que tituló Ruiz y su espejo deformante que, que dirigió Valeria Sarmiento. Y eso es lo que a mí me... me conforma ha, el cuerpo. Que conforma el cuerpo 
del tango, el viuso espejo deformante, son la visión y la dirección de dos cineastas. Great. Um, I want to I want to turn to uh, Bob and Philip uh, now. I mean, it's uh, I have a similar uh, question, but also the circumstances of your film are are quite different, uh, of course. Um, can you uh, can you talk about the relationship between um, the sorry? You'll have to forgive me if there's like a weed whacker going on in the background. Uh, there's landscapers, um, but uh, 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 but yeah, just sort of how this film. Um, uh, grew out of the work you'd done on uh, the other side of the wind. Um, and, um, you know, I, I was especially curious, I think, about once you found the material, how, um, you know, what the editing process looks like. We see, like, clappers and so on, so we assume that, you know, um, there's, like, a sort of, uh, you know, end-to-end -end kind of thing going on with the reels, but I don't, I'm not, I'm, I doubt it's that simple. And, I'm also struck by how the film begins with Hopper lamenting um, editing, like as a as a as a thing. He's like lamenting, uh, I guess, like the violence or the difficulty of editing um, uh, the material he shot for the last movie. So sorry, that was a little long winded, but uh, <laughs> take it away. <laughs> yeah. Um, in terms of origin, I mean, we we didn't find the material. Um, I mean, we had this in the hundred hours or so of materials for Other Side of the Wind. And when, um, when we went through this stuff, and I, I believe um, Bob watched this first one evening, and he can speak to that, but um, you know, my impression of it was that it wasn't something that fit the narrative arc and the script of Other Side of the Wind. Um, this was something that was shot very early on in that production process. It was something, you know, the production started in, in August of 70. This was November of 70. And this felt like, its own thing. Um, and, uh, you know, Bob had assembled it. Um, I, I believe it was Bob and Dove, one of the assistant editors. They, they, they more or less assembled it kind of reel to reel. Um, and, and I watched it and was fascinated by it. Um, and I was struck by, by, you know, different aspects of it at that time than I was more recently when I went back to it. But, um, you know, it's something that, that we set aside during the other side of the wind editing sessions. It didn't quite fit that. It didn't quite fit in terms of what Morgan Neville was doing with They'll Love Me When I'm Dead, uh, which was the companion documentary to Other Side of the Wind. Um, and so it took about a year and a half, um, to, you know, two years for me to get over my Wells fatigue um, to go back and revisit the material. Well, I, I do, do think it was, um it was shot with the intention of being used in Other Side of the Wind. Um, there was a, um, you know, there's the, the story of Other Side of the Wind is it's the story of an old filmmaker played by John Huston, uh, playing the character of Jake Hannaford. And um, the sort of structure of the movie is, is around his seven, seven, 70th birthday party. And at the party, he's invited all these young filmmakers and cinephiles and um, film students to be part of the birthday party and also to film the party with their own cameras. So it's uh, kind of a um, presented as a, a found footage type of movie. And um, Orson had invited a, a few actual real filmmakers from the time, um, Henry Jaglum, uh, Paul Mazursky, um, Curtis Harrington, and Dennis Hopper. And um, he shot interviews with these guys, just planning on using little bits and pieces to intersperse throughout the party scene um, in the introduction to the party scene. And, and I think at one point he was also planning on shooting um, little interviews between the Jake Hannaford character and, and these actual filmmakers as if he was um, in, kind of interviewing them at the party and, and um, interacting with them. So typical of Wells, um, you know, he shot a lot more footage than he would have ever used. I think he was only planning on using what we actually use in the movie and maybe a little bit more if he had actually shot the John Huston uh, um, side of the conversation. But, um, you know, he was somebody who, like the director of the other movie, loved shooting. So um, shot, ended up shooting a two and a half hour long interview with Dennis Hopper. And um, when, when I saw the footage, I, you know, I, I wanted to review all the footage to make sure that we had the right little snippets in the, in the movie. And I just, um, I put it on one night and I just found it so fascinating that I ended up staying late watching the entire thing. And um, at some point along 
the way be, before we finished uh, Other Side of the Wind, I went back in and, and basically did a rough edit of it using, you know, it was shot with two cameras, so I just really wanted to have a, a version of it. So at some point, if somebody wanted to use it in, in the future, they would have sort of a rough assembly of like the best of the both cameras assembled in sequential order. And that was essentially the basis of what we ended up with for Hopper Wells. Yeah, and, and kind of speaking to, you know, what you mentioned with the slates being in there, um, you know, so when when I went back and, and this was, I believe, over the summer, um, and I, I was kind of, you know, prompted um, or urged by, uh, by a filmmaker, my friend Nick Ebeling, who did Along for the Ride. And so he knew that there were was some material um, of Hopper, um, you know, from from the other side of the wind shoot. And he asked me how much there was. And um, and we were having lunch and I started talking to him um, very enthusiastically about what I remembered of that material. Um, and at this point, it had been about a year and a half since, you know, you know Bob and I and the whole team had finished the other side of the wind. So, um, so I remembered it very fondly and I was describing bits and pieces to him and he asked me to see some of it. And that's really what kind of started us on this journey. Um, I showed him a bit and he was really impressed. He felt like Hopper, um, you know, revealed a different side of himself that he hadn't seen. And, and he really was so familiar with, um, with Hopper's body of work, but also with a lot of the interview footage. And, and, um, and he had a relationship with, uh, with David and with Henry and with everybody else. So, so he, he started talking within just that sphere that, you know, the, the within the Hopper sphere. And, and, and so he was, you know, as familiar with them as, you know, Bob and I and everybody else have become with, everybody within the Wells world. And, and by that point, it slowly started to leak out that, you know, what this material was. And eventually, um, I got a phone call from, from one of the programmers in Venice. And that's where we had premiered Other Side of the Wind. And so, uh, so Julia called up very curious as to what we had um, and asked to see a, a little piece of the film. And, and her response really surprised me because, you know, it's obviously I, um, I felt like there was something very timely about it. And, and that's what I alluded to earlier is I, I really remembered the first 30, 40 minutes of the film and the, the film as it was assembled kind of, you know, from slate to rollout remained the same, but, um, you know, in, in the intervening two years, but the world had changed. And suddenly, um, you know, the entire political discourse and, and, you know, Wells' insistence on, on Hopper revealing, you know, his political allegiances or, you know, why he wasn't politically active at this time and being, as he dubbed him, this uh, reluctant revolutionary, I felt like that material was, it became incredibly timely. And, you know, so I, I understood when, when I had that conversation with Julia, she said, this is incredible. Uh, Julia being the, the programmer from Venice saying, I think this is an incredibly important historical document. Um, you know, it's, I, I think uh, you should look into finishing this. And if you do, we'd, we'd love to have it in Venice. And so, you know, I, I started thinking about it. And obviously, you know, first thing I did was picked up the phone and called up Bob. And, um, and, and he wasn't surprised at all. He was just, you know, it seemed as if he was just waiting for that phone call. Um, and we, we jumped straight into it. Great. I'd like, I, I'd love to follow up about, um, about Hopper as a, like this film's portrait of Hopper as a political figure. Cause it's very, it's, um, I think it is like a new kind of wrinkle, um, a little bit to our perception of that at least, but I want to go back to, uh, to Valeria and Galut and, uh, Shamila for a moment. I just wanted, I guess this is mostly a, a question, uh, for Valeria because, uh, of course you knew Raul, uh, the best. And I know that, um, I would be like I would be remiss not to ask about uh, Raul's relationship with Wells's work. Um, uh, I believe uh, Mr. Arcadin slash Confidential Report was a very important film for Raul, unless I'm conflating it with something else. But I, I know that there is like a I know there's some kind of a you know artistic uh, bond there, even if I don't know if they met ever. But could you uh, talk a bit about that? No, eh, Raúl y Well nunca se conocieron, eh, pero Raúl admiraba mucho a Wells, eso lo, lo sé. Y sé que una vez un amigo, no me acuerdo el nombre, envió un mensaje a Raúl diciendo que Wells había visto las películas de Raúl 
y que les parecía muy interesante. Y Raúl estaba muy contento de haber recibido ese mensaje, pero nunca se conocieron. Es lo que puedo decir. En todo caso, lo que los unía era el amor por filmar. Raúl adoraba filmar y yo creo que Well se nota en la película esta que la adoraba filmar también. And, uh, and uh, I'll just, I'll, we, can, we can address this quickly. What about, what about Hopper? Because I would, have, I would have imagined that something like the last movie would, would have left quite an impression no, on no, Raúl. No, no Okay. Okay, cool. Um, and then, uh, fi then, then I'd like to just ask, um, you know, uh, you worked on almost all of Raul's like 100 plus <laughs> uh, films. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, this, uh, the Tango of the Widower uh, would have been his first uh, feature, I believe, um, uh, had it been completed at the time. But then, so I'm wondering for you as his, um, sort of eternal collaborator, uh, what your impressions were of uh, sort of completing a film of his that actually, I believe, preceded your collaboration? Digamos que yo, eh, cuando vi el material, me di cuenta que el material era muy corto para hacer un largo metraje, y me recordé que Raúl siempre quiso eh, hacer una película que fuera en un sentido y en otro, una ficción que se mirara en un espejo. Él había hecho algunos ejercicios en el Instituto Nacional de Audiovisual en Francia, que eran unos pequeños cortometrajes que se hacían de esa forma. Y yo pensé que quizás Raúl, para Raúl habría sido la solución, y en el fondo pensé que Raúl le gustaría que la película se hubiera terminado así. And um, Bob and Philip, I have a, this is another sort of question, I guess, about, um, about uh, the kind of, the, like the landscape of filmmakers at the time. Uh, at the time. And um, I'm just, you know, like uh, Hopper, Hopper uh, very early in the film is like talking about a number of the sort of great, like European modernists of the, of the 60s. And um, he talks about uh, Len Rene, uh, Bunuel, Fellini, Antonioni, and um, that, uh, So uh, the political thing, uh, notwithstanding, this is also like one of Hopper's great like feats of film criticism in this film in some ways. Mm -hmm. It's like the, the most protracted discussion I've ever heard from him about like actual filmmakers. So I was just wondering sort of like for all the discussion of uh, the art and the craft and so on of cinema and the film, sort of like what your impressions were of, of listening to uh, Hopper talk about like the medium in this way. I mean, well, it's funny, I think, I think he, he false starts quite a few of the conversation, right? I think he's just like name checking to see how familiar Wells is with some of these filmmakers. I mean, Wells uh, had been in, in Europe for, you know, for 12 years from 58 to, to 70. Um, and, you know, it, it's more along the lines of, have you seen Visconti's The Damned? Uh, you have? Oh, okay. Um, what about, you know, so it's, uh, it, it's one of those where I feel like he's trying to, um, as he is in, in for, a, for a great deal of the conversation, Um, you know, showcase that he is um, very film literate. And a lot of it is kind of dropping. I think, you know, Viridiana, I think he kind of, you know, d d dives in a little bit deeper. Um, I don't know. What do you think, Bob? Uh, well, but he also uh, kind of confuses a few of the films. He's, he, um, yeah. you know, he refers Desica. to uh, 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 Sica's film, Umberto Diaz Villaloni, which is, yeah. was, um, um, <laughs> obviously not to Basica. And um, yeah, so I, I think a lot of it is, is posturing. And, and I think what's also interesting is that the films we're talking about were, were films that Orson um, like actively like despised. You know, Orson was, uh, was very much against the like Antonioni and um, sort of made um, Other Side of the Wind as a response to, to these, these um, European art films that he thought were unbearable and and overly pretentious so um so I, i think it's it's also interesting to 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 see that side of it where um you know orson is mostly just um aggravated by, by the films that um hopper is talking about 
maybe I'll maybe I'll uh, ask every, I'll ask you uh, both both uh, sides of the conversation like one more question. We'll see if we have any um, questions from the audience. I think we already have a few. Um, but uh, oh, I guess just um, back to Hopper Wells for a moment. Uh, I guess yeah, let, like uh, I guess we can address like some of the, the like political discussion in the film and Wells attempting to um, get Hopper or my sense of it was he was trying to get Hopper to kind of commit to like anything uh, whatsoever, <laughs> as opposed to just like, um, it seems like he was most responsive to like a, a you know, a, a radical like vibe, if not actual like radical politics. Um, so yeah, I was just wondering sort of now, like in, in what ways did this, did working on this, looking at this material and working on it kind of shift your perception of, of, uh, of Hopper's politics because you, it like you get the sense of someone who's like very worried about what people will think that he thinks about politics, but um, yeah, I don't yeah. Just, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I think part of it is you see somebody who's very uncomfortable in the role that he's been cast in um, because of you know kind of what happened in terms of the counterculture situation after Easy Rider. I mean, you know, it's a, if if you're comfortable in that role, you don't go and hide away in Taos, New Mexico in a commune. Um, but in, in some respects, you know, a, as much as um, the film or the material, you know, has its dramatic tension and foretells what's going to be happening with Hopper's career, not only because of the editing, but because of um, how he's talking about last movie, um, but also in terms of what, you know, what we come to know later on about his um, political allegiances. <laughs> And um, it's for uh, for Valeria Galut and Camila. Um, uh, so I'm I'd, I'd be curious to know, sort of, with um, with the tango of the widower. Um, it occurs to me that it's uh, perhaps Raoul would have liked like this. Maybe he was into quantum physics, but it's kind of like a film that's uh, super super. It's in a super position. It's both mm -hmm. in 1967 and in two, 2020. And I think maybe he would have liked the fact that it was in neither it was in neither time. Uh, but um, but I'm wondering. But for for you, for uh, for all of you, uh, um, you know, where does the film sort of sit in the the larger of if it's kind of um, if it's in both places, both historical places at the same time. <laughs> Galut le va a responder, yo creo, ¿no? Ya, eh, sí, eh, es... Eh, eh, pasa que la, primero, todo el bando desde, desde el proceso del montaje, que es como desde donde nació lo que estás describiendo también ahora, eh, pero desde el montaje, eh, cuando estábamos haciendo y logramos como articular con Valeria... Un, un, como un primer corte como muy narrativo que parecía muy, muy correcto eh, que quedó así como de alguna manera eh, nos parecía que era demasiado correcto para ser Raúl <risa> entonces empezamos a tratar de ser eh, un, un, un poco quizá eh, entre comillas ¿no? eh, eh, insolente con respecto a eso que veíamos que nos parecía que era muy correcto, es decir, como que tenía un principio, un desarrollo final, todo muy bien contadito, estaba todo muy bien en esa versión, pero, pero esto que, que no, es, no, es, no es el primer taller de cine que hizo Raúl, ¿no? Raúl que, que quería llegar más allá, seguro, con esto. Y ahí fue que eh, Valeria apareció con una sorpresa maravillosa eh, de una ocurrencia en diálogo de ella con con sus recuerdos, con Raúl. Esto tan, todo lo que estoy describiendo que puede ser muy eh, psicológico, incluso psíquico, eh, para mí es muy político. Eh, la, entonces apareció con esta idea de, de hacer un rewind de la película y, llegar, y que la película termine como en su, en su inicio, haciendo como un ejercicio casi de provocación con respecto a esa historia que recientemente habías visto. Eh, en, la, en la segunda parte de la película, ¿no? que es el, el reverse. Y, y ahí 
Claro, apareció esto que, que de alguna manera vincula los dos tiempos y como decía Chamila, los dos, los dos directores, que son como dos creadores, una, un creador y una creadora, de un mismo objeto, un mismo cuerpo, un mismo hijo, si quieres, audiovisual arcaico y, y nuevo. Y, y yo lo sitúo dentro, claro, un ejercicio quizá arqueológico por un lado, genealógico por otro, y de profunda creación. Y ahí apareció que, bueno, si estamos tratando de articular los diálogos que vienen desde la mudez total, desde el silencio absoluto, y nosotros leyendo las bocas, tratando de poner diálogos ahí, ya nos orientamos, ya tenemos una historia. Bueno, ahora esos mismos diálogos sonarían al revés, con palabras al revés, y darían un nuevo lenguaje, un nuevo lenguaje que es específico para esta película. Y en función a palabras y encuentros con, de palabras de, de Raúl con su diálogo con los actores en el, en el 67. Entonces hoy en día lo ponemos al revés y aparece una película completamente nueva. Entonces eh, ahí fue cuando, claro, dijimos de alguna manera, encontramos la película experimental que queríamos hacer. Eh, queríamos siempre hacer una película experimental eh, eh, desde el origen, por eso nos atrevimos a cuestionar esto, este resultado que nosotros habíamos logrado. Eh, que era como tan eh, eh, aristotélico, por decirlo de alguna manera, y, y atraernos a, a sumergirnos en el sonido de la película, que es como toda la segunda parte, que es mucho más eh, sensorial, con una, eh, el hallazgo de la voz no fue como al final, así casi terminando la película, como un pequeño broche al final de la voz en off de la segunda parte, que es como el mismo viudo hablándose a sí mismo como si fuera otro, en ese ejercicio de desdoblamiento que, que Raúl siempre ejercía, o, o en la mayoría de sus películas, justamente como la multiplicación de los cuerpos. Y eh, apareció otro cómplice de, 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 de Valeria y de Ruiz, también, que es Jorge Arreagada, y compone una música contemporánea que, que como que rompe también y... O, o, se incrusta en la película de manera muy contemporánea, muy expresiva, también expresiva. Eh, y eso también le dio un, una atmósfera a, a momentos eh, muy potentes, para, eh, que, que resuenan, no sé, la, la música de Jorge Ragada es bien potente. Entonces, eh, creo que fue un también fue como una luz que apareció en un, mom en un momento, así como la voz en off. Fue eh, el serrucho. Fue eh, que el serrucho, <risa> porque eh, Jorge Ragá eh, grabó serrucho, 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 el instrumento uh, muy, uh, muy casero, muy, eh, no sé, y también una orquesta de vidrios. Entonces son sonidos eh, extraños, eh, que, que Valeria dialogó con, con, con Jorge Arragada y eso encuentro que la película le dio una, una iluminación una distinta, identidad. una identidad también, muy contemporánea. Um, before we, uh, before we, we uh, run out of time, I want to get some of our uh, audience questions. Um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll begin uh, with the The first name that jumps out at me, which is uh, the film critic Jonathan Rosenbaum, has offered a comment and a question. The, this is for, the, for Philip and Bob. Um, he said, uh, Wells revered, well, first is the comment, Wells revered De Sica and much of Fellini, and he certainly respected Bunuel, Dreyer, and other European art directors. He disliked Antonioni, Rene, and Brisson, but I don't think one can call him hostile to European art films in general. But then he asks, may I ask when, if ever, The Other Side of the Wind might become available on DVD and Blu-ray? <laughs> awesome. Hi, Jonathan. Hey, Jonathan. Um, <laughs> uh, we're working on it. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think, no secret that uh, Netflix has been working together with Criterion, releasing some of their catalog. Um, obviously, you know, it's, I'm not a party to those conversations. Um, I know that They've taken place and continue to take place. Um, I know that, you know, it's, um, I think for, for our part in terms of, because um, I, I know that Jonathan, you're referring to um, other side of the wind in that question. 
But uh, in terms of this title, obviously, this is a totally separate film uh, with a totally separate uh, set of rights. And so, you know, if if um, if there's a possibility to, um, let's say, you know, inspire both parties to to come to some type of a deal, um, you know, using this title, using uh, Hopper Wells uh, to be able to do so, you know, we'll certainly try. And another another question for you guys from Harshal Alurkar, um, who I'll just, this is, it's kind of long, so I'll just boil it down to, um, this person is curious if you think this conversation between Wells and Hopper had uh, any influence on Hopper's subsequent uh, work or his way with editing, uh, perhaps uh, as early, I don't know if the timing would have made sense for the last movie to- He was still reflect. editing it. Yeah, although he, yeah, he like he talks about it like it's so past tense, but you can tell it's not really. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but yeah, so, so I don't know, I guess it's kind of about the, um, what kind of footprint do you think this conversation left on? I don't feel that he took any of Orson's advice. Um, Orson always talked about being the enemy of the film and, and being very hard on the footage and being tough with the movie. and. And I think um, the way uh, last movie turned out and um, w was sort of uh, kind of the opposite, a, a guy who was, you know, very self-indulgent and, um, you know, ended up um, kind of paying the price when, when it was uh, critically um, and um, popularly uh, like poorly received. Um, I, I think o over the years, people have now I have a different impression of it, but at the time, um, I think it was just seen as a sort of a very self-indulgent project. And so I, I don't think he did listen to Orson. Um, and I, I don't, and um, so, and I don't know if he ever did. I, I, I do think he respected Orson as a filmmaker. And um, I think Orson also respected, uh, I, I mean, I, I think uh, it, it, the feeling was mutual. So um, that's all I can say. But it, but it was interesting in terms of the fact that, you know, both were working on films, obviously at different stages, you know, about films that were metafiction. Um, and, and Orson does ask him about, you know, how is the film within the film going to be shown? Um, I mean, this is, you know, firm, you know, to the best of our knowledge, a lot of this stuff uh, was still taking shape in Wells's mind in terms of how he was going to construct the other side of the wind. Um, so it's interesting, you know, what he asks and how he asks it. Um, so, yeah. um, question for uh, Valeria Galut and Camila: um, sort of speculation about um, the existence of even more um, incomplete Ruiz films, which um, could perhaps find their completion or their transformation. Uh, in 2021 or later. Sí, exactamente. Estamos en este momento en el proceso de terminar un, otra película de Raúl que se llamó El realismo socialista y que es una película que él filmó eh, un poco antes del golpe de Estado sobre un tema muy político que era cómo se vivía el socialismo en Chile en nivel de poblaciones y en nivel de, de las clases medias e intelectuales. Estamos en ese proceso y estamos trabajando en, en ello. Tenemos muy para rato. <laughs> Todavía. Um, respecto yeah. respecto a, la, a lo que pasa que justamente el realismo socialista eh, es un nuevo proyecto que está, está como en una especie de brasa aún, eh, antes de que se encienda todo. Eh, está, eh, tiene que ver con lo que estábamos hablando antes de la política también, ¿no? está, está vinculado eh, esta visión, se quiere hacer como una comparación. Pero el cine de la época, de hecho en el mismo contexto de, de tango del viudo, en su momento, que, que Raúl filmó el 67, eh, 
Chile, o el cine, está realmente politizado en una visión como instrumental al servicio de ideología, en su mayoría. Los directores querían de alguna manera, eh, eh, el cine era una herramienta política de concientización, de observación, de, también de cosas eh, utilitarias, así como directas, como de, de, de educación y de formación de las masas para para instruir dentro de lo que era, qué sé yo, el aparato guevarista de los partidos de, de, de Che Guevara, de la guerrilla. Y Raúl aparece entre medio de esa... Valeria me puede contradecir completamente vos. Eh, aparece entre medio de esa... Ya lo estoy pensando. Entre medio de ese contexto, y aparece con, por ejemplo, esta película que era acerca de un señor que, se, qué sé yo, que se perturba psíquicamente por la muerte de su esposa y su esposa lo empieza como a, a, a circundar en esta realidad a propósito del de, de traspaso de, de, de un fantasma que empieza a habitar su cotidiano. Entonces, contra, completamente contrario a lo que podría decirse el, el, el uso ideológico de la película, era más que bien hacer cine por el amor al cine, y de lo cual Raúl era absolutamente fanático, creo. Eh, y, y Realismo Socialista, que es este nuevo proyecto, justamente se ancla en, en, en una forma de ver el realismo por, el, por los soviéticos, ¿no? que era también un arte utilitario, eh, que está al servicio de lo, de lo social, y Raúl de alguna manera lo pone como en tensión en esta película, haciendo una, de alguna manera una sátira, eh, en un tono muy espeluznantemente irónico, respecto a lo que estaba sucediendo en Chile, en Chile durante el gobierno de la Unidad Popular, en la relación de, la, de las, como las bases proletarias con la representación de sus partidos que supuestamente lo guiaban hacia una revolución y hacia un nuevo Chile socialista. Ahí está anclada la película y es una mirada muy divertida y muy crítica, sobre todo respecto al proceso histórico de Chile, que de alguna manera hoy también se está replicando, hoy en las en lo que eran las calles <ríe> del país hasta hace un poco tiempo atrás, que estaban, la verdad, alzadas en, un, en una nueva idea de, de país. I think we're, uh, we're, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to uh, just take this, uh, this last little bit of time that we have to uh, Uh, sort of clear out and um, if I, if uh, Bob and Philip, if you have any questions for uh, Valeria and Galut and Camila, it could just be, you know, it could be about uh, process, the film itself, whatever you like. Uh, and then you guys are, are welcome to do that as well. Or we can just call it a, uh, whatever works. So Philip and Bob, do you want, do you guys have any questions? <laughs> You can take a moment too. I don't. I don't mean to. Yo creo que creo que los festivales de cine del mundo van a crear una nueva sección de cine de arqueología del cine o de cine ultratumba, de cine de fantasma, porque nuevo género. Sí, está apareciendo películas que que hoy en día están más vías que nunca, y entonces. Tendría que haber una sección en los nuevos festivales de cine, sí, de cine de arqueología. Sí. Yo, yo, en, este, en este suceso que estamos, en este, ¿cómo se dice? Resurrection. Estoy, yeah. estoy alucinado porque de alguna manera siento como una... We'll talk, we'll talk after the... Una, the una, una sincronización entre los fantasmas latinoamericanos y los fantasmas norteamericanos. <laughs> sí. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Como Muchas siempre. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Ha sido muy interesante. Un gusto a todos. Un placer. Y Philip y Bob, I guess you can just, uh, you can just say your, your, whatever you want to say before we go and we can leave it there. I mean, on my end, thanks for having us. Um, you know, it's a, we premiered uh, Alice Tully for, uh, for Other Side of the Wind. Uh, two years ago in 18. So it, this uh, this one has taken a, a similar path going from from Venice to uh, to NYFF. So uh, so thanks again for for having us at the festival. It's a real pleasure. Yeah.
Yeah, thank you. And, and thanks for having us all together on the panel because we're all sort of doing similar things, uh, trying to get into the head of a filmmaker who's no longer with us and uh, figuring out his intentions um, and um, trying to do justice to a project that was, you know, um, unable to be finished long ago. So I think it's, um, it's, it's great that we, we could all be together talking about uh, this kind of unique way of making films with, when the director is no longer here. And well, well, thank you all. Hopefully next time we'll all be together in person. Imagine that. But uh, until then, uh, take care. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, adios.